Here we go. Hey, everybody. My name is Aaron Shea, and welcome to Habitat Now, and I appreciate your patience during all technical issues you've had on the way here. Thank you for joining us today, and thank you for those of you who are watching on Facebook. It is my honor to, to uh, include artist Jaime Guerrero, who has traveled from California and now lives in Pittsburgh, uh, to join me today uh, to discuss his life career and work and, you know, and what he does for the community, which is I'm looking to learn more about during this talk. So I'm going to take over your screens briefly to go through a little housekeeping about what's coming on and going on in our gallery. So as many of you know, the International is this month. Can't believe it. Time flies. We're having our next International, the most important one, which is our 50th, at April 28th through the 30th here in Royal Oak, Michigan. You're invited. There's all kinds of events planned. It's going to be an incredible experience. So make sure you have a chance to RSVP and join. You can RSVP at thehabitat.com. Many artists are coming. I'm putting together a list of who's going to be there and who you can meet. Um, we're going to be focused on our new version of our Habitat Direct presentation. It'll be hosted on our website. So you'll be able to see a lot of the works that are available for sale at home for those that can't make it or those of you who want to come later and see the work in person in May, June, July. We're going to be visiting the Michigan Regional Glass Exhibition here uh, at the West Bloomfield JCC Jewish Community Center. We actually sponsored this event and had a, I had a chance to go see the works from the local artists, local meaning Michigan, Ohio, and around the area. It's a very impressive show. and We chose some winners uh, that received some uh, funds for appreciation for participating. And I actually bought a piece upstairs, some cups. You might have saw it on Facebook that I was really impressed with at the show. So something else to see. The Masterworks auction should be online today if I can get all my pictures. Um, this will be uh, the first day of the event, April 28th here in Royal Oak and also the at live auction years. Here's your first glimpse at some of the pieces that will be in the, ex in the auction. It's been fun putting this together. Uh, the trip to Seattle is still planned for May 9th through 15th. I don't know if room is left, but you're welcome to find out. You can call me or, or, or call, call the gallery. We can see if there's room left on this trip. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Jaime. We've got some technical errors. So let me um, stop sharing my screen. Or no, let me kick out of this. I'm going to put it in here. Let's just go straight to the video. So um, Jaime, would you join me? Please, um, please unmute yourself. And we can talk mm -hmm. about this, this, this video you sent me. And this was recent, right? This video was made recently. Yes, yeah, so uh, I just, uh, sorry, uh, so hi everyone, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Jaime Guerrero. <clears throat> um, I guess uh, we're going to show a little video of um, a recent uh, residency I did to Wisconsin. Um, Jeremy uh, Profalka and Stephanie Trenchard uh, have a private studio there. And uh, <clears throat> they, they've invited me for the second time to do a residency with them. And uh, it's kind of a collaboration effort where we, um, I kind of uh, share some of my knowledge with uh, uh, scoping um, uh, aspects, glass making, and uh, Stephanie and Jeremy have kind of shared some of their knowledge uh, with painting on glass uh, using enamels, and also uh, they do something, uh, they produce glass sculptures, paint them, and then um, in, in insert them or invest them. I forget what the term that they use, but um, they actually put the sculptures into sand castings. And then um, it's a really, really fun process. So I've, I've, I've gotten a lot of exposure to to their processes. And so it's kind of, we, we, we've been sharing just knowledge back and forth, creating uh, my work and then also their work. So uh, here's a video showing a little bit of my residency there. Um, this, uh, which was about a week ago. So Jeremy Popalka uh, put this video together and um, I'll be doing, you know, I'll talk a little bit about what I'm making and the process. So I'm making a little glass sculpture that I call homies. Um, and I think it's gonna show uh, a few different pieces that I did while I was there. Um, and so Chelsea is one of the assistants that they work with, and she's an amazing assistant. They 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 all are just amazing. It's it's a great um, time every, every when I go there. We we have a, an amazing um, time and really kind of produce a lot of technical high end work. 
Um, so here I am making. Sorry. We're, play, we're playing it slightly faster just to give you an idea of this process and, and how we can uh, tell you more about it, just so you know I'm sped it up just a touch. Sure. So, um, so here I am sculpting a hand. And uh, so, you know, part, part of the difficulty of making a homie is making things look symmetrical and making them look like they're the right size uh, for, as, for a figure. Um, so, but not to mention all, obviously all the other details that go into making a, a figurative sculpture. Um, so basically these pieces are, were kind of inspired originally by the little homies that people buy in vending machines, uh, that came out maybe 15 years ago. Uh, originally the idea came from there, but, um, eventually they, you know, they kind of took on a different form where I was uh, being influenced and inspired by just characters and figures and, and people that I grew up with um, in East L.A. Um, so that was, uh, and then I guess a new inspiration now is, is creating pieces that talk about, you know, that are kind of dealing with iconography and, and uh uh, stereotypes, maybe cliches uh, in the Mexican culture or the Chicano culture, um, but for me to make them in highly technical glass form um, kind of gives them a place uh, where people can can people that come from that that culture can see themselves and 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 you know uh, identify with the iconography and and the actual postures and characters that they create um, because obviously in the mainstream art world there's there seems to be a, a lack of representation and, and equity um, in, in this regard so this is my my small attempt to try to change that a little bit um, so here I am making a pair of pants um, and so yeah, so so working with sculpting is definitely a a very different way than making uh, symmetrical decorative work. Is there's just a whole different process of working, and uh, your assistants and your team have to have an awareness that's just slightly different um, of how to like handle the glass and maneuver it. And uh, there's a lot of torch work involved to to uh, to do to really kind of hone in on detail work. And, uh, uh, you know, when you're working, like making a face this size, it's, you know, you don't, the margin of error is very small. And when I put these pieces together, here's Jeremy bringing a, a pair of pants, which we took out of a kiln. So I make all these parts beforehand, and then we use enamel paints to paint some of the, the imagery that I'm using. And then, um, and then we reheat all the parts in a kiln. And then here I am attaching the parts one by one. <laughs> so here's the shirt with that painting. I just, uh, you know, I probably painted the day before. And then now we're attaching the arms. In this particular piece, I think I chose to put the head on first. Sometimes I put the arms on first, depending on the complexity of the detail. Um, you know, I may do things a little differently. Um, these pieces, I, I chose to put shirts, and uh, I guess one of them will have like a little flannel shirt um, that you'll, no, not a flannel shirt, I'm sorry, uh, a hoodie, this guy, uh, a little clown homie with a Olmec face in the in the piece, and this one has a uh, Virgen de Guadalupe, which is a very ubiquitous uh, icon for the Mexican and Chicano cultures. Um, so one of them has an Omic, a Virgen, and then there's a Mayan Prince Pacal on the blue one. And that's um, a, little, a little window into what it takes to make uh, one of these guys. I mean, obviously that's very simple. It's very simplified. It's an eight, eight minute video. And these pieces could take, you know, as, many, as long as like a week to produce. So, um, uh, with, 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 these, with, with, these, with these works, uh, I mean, like the, the painting on the shirts, is that something you've done in the past too, or is that something new? 
Um, I did do a little bit of painting a long time ago. It was a little bit um, Jim Jane, uh, Jim Della, who is uh, part of this this uh, this meeting, um, has collected some of the the homies that I that were some of the first homies that I. That I did, and I think in the slideshow I might have a few of of them. I'm not sure if I have the ones you have, James, but um, but I did paint a little bit on them. But I I I was trying a different process. I was doing paradise enamel uh, paint um, when they were still around, and that was about maybe 15 years ago. And uh, I wasn't getting, I wasn't using the paint as a like a painting, where I, which is what I'm doing now. Um, Last year, the residency I did with Stephanie and Jeremy, um, I think I also was doing a little bit more just experimentation. Uh, it was a little simpler, uh, but now I really kind of, um, I'm really pushing doing full on paintings on, you know, on these figures where I'm moving the, the enamels. I'm kind of, uh, this, especially this trip around, I feel like I really discovered how to paint, how to use a paint in a different way. It's definitely much harder than oil paint. Gotcha. So, it looks pretty um, amazing. You are talented with the paintbrush too. So I'm glad you're adding you. to the pieces. I wanted to um, to show everybody like how the story comes together when Jaime was talking about these, these original homies idea coming out of the vending machines. I actually own three of these from my childhood. I still have today. And they, they're, they're designed very similarly to what he is creating. And I have I got them out of a vending machine. I think it was in a White Castle or something when I was like in my 20s. And I just happened to have them all. And this is kind of the inspiration. And don't mind my background, but the inspiration <laughs> for, you know, what he's doing. And I've had these little guys with me. My kids are probably ready to destroy them, but I've kept them away from them. And they they're, they're, they kind of tie the whole story together for me personally because, um, you know, this is something that I've involved with and he was totally inspired by. So, Jaime, will you? Take over the screen, please, and uh, we'll we can see what you're going to show us, which I'm looking forward to. You, okay. Besides being an artist, you're a big part of the community. And we saw you sculpting the smaller figures, but your scale gets incredibly large. Um, and that's what I want to see, too, is like you have a whole vision on how you get, you create things. And we saw it from a small, but I'm looking forward to seeing what, what else is, you have to show us. Okay, so can you see my screen right now? Yep, Oops. yep. Let's go back to slide one and you're there. Perfect. <clears throat> okay, so here uh, is the first slide. Um, since we're running a little late, I might try to, <clears throat> I don't know if you want me to try to still do, stick to the hour time frame, so to, till two or a little later. I'm not you sure. Can just, you can just go with the flow, my friend. Let's, let's okay. go with the flow. <laughs> okay. All right, so I just want to, I know all you guys are familiar with the Blown Away series uh, shows that are coming out right now. Well, I was the first winner before that show even came out because uh, Horning invited me to come and do a, a, a residency for a week there. So I didn't actually have to be in the Blown Away show to, uh, you know, I managed to uh, get in the, uh, uh, to do a residency there, which is a really amazing experience. Um, so this is um, a, a, a American Cra uh, Craft in America doing a, a video which is on YouTube, um, and this particular segment is called uh, Neighbors. So uh, they did a, I think, an 11-minute video on, on basically my background and my work. And so if you want to get a little bit of a of a different overview from their take on my my career and some of the work I do. Um, you can check out that video. I think Aaron shared it in, in, in several places. Um, but this is a picture of basically Craft in America uh, filming me making a life-size glass sculpture of a child um, at Corning using their, their amazing facilities and their incredible team. So you can see here um, where I'm making the, a body of a little girl wearing a dress. And I, I think I just attached the legs. We're kind of, uh, <clears throat> uh, I think I'm working on the ripples here for the dress. Here's another little uh, girl, a sculpture of a little girl. So you kind of see the scale, I believe. Maybe it's about 36 to 40 something inches. Um, so the, the corning is 
you know, an amazing place. You, I mean, they have some of the best equipment in the world and uh, obviously a very skilled team. Um, George and, and Chris and all the other guys here, Eric, um, are amazing, amazing, uh, very skilled people. So I'm going to, so I just wanted to touch that a little bit because I know Aaron shared that video. Um, so I'm, the, the slide presentation will be a little bit of just kind of showing the timeline of the trajectory of the work I've done since early on. Um, it won't be necessarily particularly perfectly in order, but you can kind of get an idea of the different uh, bodies of work that I've done over the years. So originally, uh, uh, after my undergrad, I was doing these decorative pieces that um, I was selling in San, in San Francisco mostly at a place called Gump's, um, and it's a high-end department store. And I was basically, I had my own like section and the thing was that I can make whatever I wanted. So um, I, I didn't have limitations on making similar pieces or, or the same kind of in a production style base. So I was making these, these ring pieces that I developed this technique inspired by geodes. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, basically uh, looking at geological formations um, and sedimentary volcanic rocks and stuff like that. And, uh, <clears throat> also inspired by the painter Joseph Albers, who um, taught at Bauhaus, and uh, just the interest, uh, the interest of uh, using color theory to kind of set a mood or have some effect on your psyche. I produced uh, kind of these different color experimentations using circular forms instead of squares. So these are the early, you know, decorative work that I was selling really well at Gumps and different places. Um, also, you know, incorporating Italian techniques. I was really, obviously I'm, I'm really into technique uh, developing and, and, and kind of refining different, different forms of technique, whether it's Italian techniques or sculpting techniques, or I'm, I'm just kind of, you know, I'm just really into different forms. Um, so after I, um, <clears throat> I, I guess I have always saw my work kind of taking more on a sculptural fine art realm. So this is kind of the earlier, the, basically the first homies that I've e I ever made. And this is my first kind of jumping into making more of a sculptural uh, uh, work. So I, I produced these three pieces. These are the first ones I ever made and donated them to the Bay Area Glass Institute for their very first Sachs Fellowship uh, Award auction. And they happened to win first prize. So uh, these guys, you know, I was totally kind of blown away because um, I just didn't think any, any of the collectors or any of the, of the people there would, would be able to relate to these guys. And I remember, uh, I think it was uh, Dorothy Sachs who asked Stephen Alridge, uh, who was a director at the time, uh, she asked him, what is a homie? So I just <laughs> thought that was pretty funny. <clears throat> Great. But here we have a, a girl wearing a tube top and mini skirt scene on a keg, a guy maybe throwing gang signs or maybe trying to pick up on the girl. Mm -hmm. And then you have another guy uh, without a shirt uh, drinking a, a beer. So... Um, <clears throat> But um, I guess they were really intrigued with the, te the technical aspects to these pieces. And I'm not sure if Barbara is with us right now uh, on this meeting, uh, Barbara Poole, but she and, and Warren Poole um, purchased these pieces originally um, at that auction. So here are some of the older, older the first, the first kind of couple of series of these guys. So as you can see, you know, I'm kind of inspired by creating gesture um, and, and, and a personality and character through, uh, through these figures. So some of these early pieces were, were kind of about that and just kind of seeing a glimpse of maybe my, my, my upbringings in Boyle Heights, which, you know, 40 beers, 40 ounce beer bottles were kind of ubiquitous uh, because in 
low-income communities, beer is actually cheaper than food. Mm. So here, uh, uh, these are some of the more current pieces. So this is what I mean by it's not necessarily in order. Um, this is uh, Lulu. Um, she actually reminds me of, of a girl I had a crush in in high school who was a, I was more in the punk scene, but she was kind of a, a, a little bit of a chola. Um, but uh, this is a piece that I produced at a residency in North Carolina last year. And here's another recent piece uh, last year. This guy, uh, so those, the last piece and this one and the next one will be, are the pieces that are currently available to, through Habitat NGG. Um, this is, uh, I call them COVID homie. So a lot of my work really kind of is inspired by things that happen in current, current, current world events. So, um, so I make these homies and I thought I'd make one with a mask um, that looked kind of shocked. Um, kind of the expression that maybe we all feel or have felt over the last year or so. Um, so, <clears throat> and with this one, I painted um, kind of some of the stripes on the flannel with the enamel painting. Here's a, another uh, character. I think uh, the, the title of this one is Dino. Um, kind of reminds me of a guy I knew growing up again in, in Boyle Heights in East LA. Um, so, so this is kind of, I guess, when maybe the first time that I started to really try to use um, paint. Well, in this in this particular case, obviously to look like graffiti. So I painted a skull uh, on this guy, uh, mixing the black and and white paint. <clears throat> I guess I didn't. I thought I had the picture of the other arm, but I didn't. Um, so moving along. <clears throat> so those three those those three pieces, um, including this guy. Uh, will be available uh, are the three pieces that are av currently available um, through uh, through uh, the NGG gallery. And the ones that I made um, at Jeremy and Stephanie's studio, those will should become available in the next couple of weeks. We'll put out a, a little if, newsletter when everything's available too, so people can see them all. At okay. Once. In case anybody's interested. So. Um, I also was very obviously inspired in, in culture and in, in Mesoamerican uh, work and some of the uh, accomplishments of the different uh, the different kind of cultures that existed in, in, in Mesoamerica. So I was really intrigued by this one, uh, which shows the three, the three stages of life, youth, old, and then death. Um, so I call it tres caras, three, three, three faces. And this piece um, <clears throat> was purchased by <clears throat> some collectors that are actually mass collectors. I'm not sure if they're, if they're on, on right now, but uh, uh, Ron and Pamela, you are, how, how are you guys doing? Um, so they, they're, they have an amazing, beautiful mass collection of Mexican masks. And they were really intrigued by a show where I had a couple of Olmec masks that I, and they immediately recognized them and wanted to come to my studio and. Um, love, fell in love with this piece and uh, have, have it in their collection now. And, um, and now we've obviously become good, great friends over the years and they've collected uh, several, several of the sculptures. Um, this is another early piece. Um, um, I'm not sure Ed Kirshner is here, but Ed Kirshner is in Ed Kirshner's collection. Um, uh, it's a, a Aztec sculpture. Um, I call him Birdman. And uh, you know, really kind of pushing the technical things that you can do with glass and trying to make glass look like terracotta and also obviously different different materials like this one. Uh, it's an Olmec sculpture of a seated ruler uh, made to look like jade. So just the notion, the idea of taking a material and making it look like a different material takes on a whole different form that's neither one or the other. So that that uh, idea really kind of resonated with me, but also, you know, taking like an archaeological approach through process for me to learn about about you know my my uh, my ancestors. Whoops, oh, I don't know why that one didn't load up. But <clears throat> here's 
uh, an omic head, a, a pretty large scale, probably the largest I could make it, um, uh, humanly possible in glass. Using a team in Northern California, Guido uh, Sterlitz had an amazing studio, this amazing glass floor also. Um, this piece was purchased by uh, San Bernardino Museum for the Permalink collection. So uh, if anybody wants to see it, they can visit that museum. What size is it? Um, I don't I don't remember the exact dimensions, but I think it's like 20 by 24 or something like that wide. But, gotcha. you know, when you're when you're sculpting a, something that has that much volume in it, it is really intense. Like mm -hmm. um, standing in front of this thing and emitting uh, the heat that it did, I just basically felt like I was in the glory hole the whole time. Um, <laughs> I imagine so. It was, it was pretty intense. It was really, really intense. Uh, I mean, I've made really large scale pieces. You'll see a second. Um, I, li I like, I don't necessarily work big to, you know, to, to, to just work big. I like to um, basically make p uh, representations of work that are, are, are the scale, are, are life size scale. So um, obviously, this is not life size because the Olmec heads were colossal, but. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just wanted to make it as big as I uh, as I possibly could. Um, here's another piece, uh, probably from Nayarit, replica uh, of an actual uh, existing piece. Um, and actually, this is one of the few Mesoamerican sculptures I still have available. So if anybody's interested, they can inquire through Habitat or contact me, and we can kind of figure it out. This is a piece. Uh, this is a large scale piece. Uh, do you remember how tall this one is, uh, Aaron? I think it's 28 inches tall. Yeah, so it's a pretty large scale piece, also inspired uh, by uh, Mesoamerican culture. I, I believe this is Aztec, um, and it's supposed to look like stone, so you can see uh, hopefully the resemblance. Um, and the, the original piece, I saw at a museum, it was a museum where it was showing uh, relationships between a relationship between Diego Rivera and Picasso, and Diego Rivera happened to own a large Mesoamerican uh, have a large Mesoamerican collect collection. So this was the real piece was actually in Diego Rivera's collection originally. Um, so I try to make this piece, and I think it's pretty close to the actual scale of the original. Hmm. Um, yeah, that that piece, piece that piece is in, the, is in the vault right now, I believe. So. We have that one at the gallery mm. if anyone wants to see it. Oh yeah, so that's another piece that's currently available uh, through Habitat. Um, <clears throat> so here's another piece. Uh, I wanted to show this piece because um, it, is <clears throat> it comes from the Chinesco cult culture. Um, it's a seated female figure. And um, I think it was usually they, they would create these pieces um, um, as a way to kind of prolong uh, life is, is, a, is a fertility figure, um, maybe from around the second to fourth century BC, E. Um, but this piece actually made it on the cover of <clears throat> American Craft Magazine. And um, I'm gonna brag a little bit, but I actually took that photograph also. So <laughs> I'll check it on the cover twice, so. <laughs> Thanks. So here's another Olmec piece uh, sold uh, in LA through an exhibition I was having that was uh, in conjunction with Pacific Standard Time. I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, uh, this in initiative that uh, the Getty in LA does, uh, uh, Southern California, they do a uh, Pacific Standard Time maybe three years. I'm not sure how COVID has, has altered that, but um, I was part of two exhibitions through Pacific Standard Time in 2019, I believe it was, or no, it must have been before that. I can't remember exactly the year. I'm really bad with dates. Um, so I had a couple of exhibitions. This was one of the exhibitions at Bergamont Station in Santa Monica. And I don't know if you guys recognize this guy, um, but this is a Cheech Marin from Cheech and Chong. <laughs> <clears throat> and obviously he's been in a lot of other things as well, but. Uh, he's a big uh, Chicano art collector, but I think he might have been a little too stoned when he came to visit my exhibition to really appreciate my work. But um, <laughs> so, <laughs> but here's some of the detail work, and um, here um, this is a 
uh, obviously a detail of uh, omic uh, uh, turquoise, uh, meant to look like turquoise sculpture, and just to see some of the some of the detail work. And I'm not sure if Annette uh, Annette on, on Atwood is uh, with us right now, but uh, she purchased uh, some of these uh, for her permanent for her collection. Here's a piece that I I really like. Um, um, I call it La Venta, uh, and it comes from uh, the original was buried uh, probably six to nine feet underground, uh, was discovered by some archaeologists in Tabasco, Mexico, and they were found exactly in this formation, uh, which is really intriguing to me. And um, the way the postures uh, of these figurines are uh, the, the way they're depicted uh, represents uh, shamans uh, in prayer and in meditation in prayer. So their, their, their knees are slightly bent, their arms are slightly forward, and their heads are a little bit kind of uh, looking up, which was a, a posture of, um, of, uh, of, of, uh, of in meditation and in prayer. Um, so they're all uh, in the large and elongated heads points to that they're uh, shamans. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of uh, speculation on what these, these, this piece meant uh, by different scholars. Uh, I, I really like the, uh, the, the idea that these were shamans praying uh, to kind of keep the, their culture and, 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 and uh, to kind of keep and prolong the, 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 the culture and keep everyone healthy. Um, so they were praying to the gods for 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 a, a better life, and you know that's something that maybe uh, reflects on today's time too. That that's something that we definitely need. Um, so this piece, the original pieces are probably you know like six to seven centimeters large, um, but I kind of wanted to really blow this piece up. So these pieces are probably uh, sixteen to eighteen inches tall. So it doesn't look like it, but this piece is actually six feet wide. Mm. Uh, by I'm not sure the cow, some of the cows can be like 20 inches tall probably. Um, so it looks wow. looks a little small here, but it is a really big piece. And um, I'm hope uh, I'm I'm showing this piece to a museum um, that may be interested in in purchasing it uh, currently. So here is just a detail of, of a hand, um, obviously in painting, but also in glass. Hands are one of the most difficult things to make. So here's a life-size sculpture of a hand that was actually inspired by my mom's passing a few years ago. Um, so you can see some of the detail work. And I just wanted to show these images because, you know, it really shows and illustrates a little bit of the process and what, I mean, it, this piece took like hours. Um, so uh, for glass blowing, you know, that's a really kind of a long time and the margin of error, you know, you can't remake it. So it's a one shot deal. Either it works or it doesn't. So, um, so, you know, so this is a, a detailed uh, glass hand that I actually made last year at Jeremy and Stephanie's studio um, um, in uh, Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin uh, with the residence, the first residency I did there. I also wanted to kind of show that um, or to just illustrate some of the work that I did before. Um, this is kind of now touching on some of my passion with clear glass. Um, I really, really love to make sculptures clear because I love the purity of, of glass and, and the, the, the transparent, you know, the whole notion of something almost becoming invisible, um, something being there but not really being there, um, which also has ties for me with a lot of nostalgic uh, you know, uh, nostalgia and memories. Um, this piece was uh, basically a uh, sculpture that uh, is based on a memory I had of uh, being really small. It was maybe about six or seven years old and going to uh, Mexico City and seeing uh, my uncles with, who are really amazing cowboys and uh, they were uh, participating in rodeos. And uh, I was eight years old and, you know, as an eight year old growing up in, in East LA and not seeing, not having too many heroes, especially on TV, you know, everything you see was like, people are, you know, being depicted as criminals or, or Latinos, uh, you know, or working in kitchens or, or some of the 
some of the your normal kind of like stereotypical <clears throat> representation. Uh, so you know, growing up, I didn't have very many heroes. So when I went to Mexico and saw my uncles in these huge horses uh, in rodeos, and they were uh, actually happened. One of my uncles on my mom's part, side of the family visiting Mexico was the champion charro uh, uh, cowboy of, of her town. And then when I went to my dad's town that same year, uh, during La, Las Fiesta, the festivities uh, uh, early on in the year, uh, my uncle, my dad's brother was the champion charro of his town. So, um, and the way the, the cowboys were given a point were in the form of these paper mache flowers so when they were awarded points, uh, they would bring their horse around and a woman would have these, uh, uh, with these women would make these flowers all night and then would uh, award the, the flower to the cowboy and tie it to the horse. So I remember my uncle's horses just being like drenched in flowers because they were just so good. So I have this memory of just this exaggeration uh, of, these, of these paper mache flowers. But this piece uh, actually won the second Sachs Fellowship Award um, at the at the Barrier Glass Institute a few years later after the the homies, so I kind of felt like okay, well I, I guess it wasn't a fluke, you know I got I got another one. So um, <laughs> and then uh, that piece was validated a little further with uh, um, the Oakland Museum um, had this piece in their exhibition uh, for God I forgot what the what the big uh, thing was that uh, that year, um, maybe it was the 20th um, anniversary of Glass or no, it must have been something else. I can't remember. Um, but this piece um, um, was purchased for their permanent collection. So this is in the Oakland Museum's permanent collection currently. And you can see kind of like the exaggerated flowers. Um, they're close to life size. Very nice. Uh, Here's another clear piece. I uh, uh, was also dealing with a memory when I was little, going hunting with uncles, and you know uh, the idea of rite of passage, and and just kind of how how in history uh, a rite of passage for a male sometimes has like a a violent kind of a, a ceremony or a ritual, and it kind of felt like that. For me, I mean, I mean, the, kind of, the, the slide didn't change. We tried pressing it again. We're still looking at number thirty-five. There you go. Okay, is that did that's it, better? Did yep. It move? Yep. Oh, you're thirty-six now. Okay. Yep. <clears throat> so, so yeah. So this, this, these deer. I did. A, I did a whole series of uh, deer heads, and I had a couple of exhibitions uh, with these pieces. Um, and and uh, uh, yeah, several of them are in, in private collections. Um, but yeah, basically it was it was uh, uh, dealing with a uh, whole no notion of, of rite of passage and, and and ritual and ceremony, which you know if, if you notice uh, like the, with La Venta piece and some of the pieces you'll see, ritual is something that's kind of been something that kind of continues to happen in my work. Uh, something that just kind of is is important, you know, the ritual of of, of working with glass and and also you know the, the art that I'm making um, where these ideas come from. Um, but also the way we view glass, that whole ritual of the way uh, work is represented in a, in a museum or a gallery and uh, how people navigate through a space and that whole process. So, um, so I'm currently actually talking to a museum about a potential solo exhibition for next year. Um, and, uh, and yes, a, a, a ritual will be a big part of that, that exhibition. So here's a, a little bit more nostalgia. Um, growing, uh, you know, the, the, this, this piece totally represents nostalgia for me because when I made these pieces, um, they, everybody had a story about a bug or a roach. So I was really um, intrigued with the whole idea that, you know, that a uh, glass, small little glass sculpture can, you know, emote uh, uh, these these memories of somebody who had a experience with a roach, or you know, some some like horrific or or you know, just kind of a, a, a crazy experience uh, of some kind. So everybody was coming up to me at this exhibition with 
uh, story that they had. Um, but these pieces for me also represent um, kind of uh, rising above like hardships, uh, just kind of the, the duality between uh, hardship and, and kind of uh, making uh, and transforming that into something beautiful. So uh, taking something that is, is, is usually seen as something grotesque and then turning it into like a beautiful, delicate, precious sculpture. So, um, so yeah, these pieces uh, uh, had a couple of different meanings for me. I can imagine that this, kind of, this kind of thing being put in a gonzo type experience where people wouldn't expect art and there is a glass roach. <laughs> exactly. Right. Um, so some people really were intrigued by them and some people were really put out by them and grossed out by them. So uh, hey, uh, uh, an emotional makes, response makes is a good response. <laughs> Yeah. So here's another piece, um, you know, dealing with, uh, you know, so, some social issues uh, that I that I that was very prevalent growing up in Boyle Heights in East L.A. and also working um, not that long ago in, in South L.A. Uh, with youth, um, the whole prison industrial complex and uh, criminalizing people that that live in underserved communities, uh, people of color and how our prison industrial complex is by far the largest um, in the world. Um, nobody even comes close to the amount of people we house in jail currently. And, uh, and a lot of those are uh, people of color and um, working in, in South LA and, and also just growing up in Boyle Heights, seeing how people just get singled out and uh, how they're profiled just for being a, a certain color and uh, and how a lot of my students in, in LA in Watts uh, were uh, that I, you know I'll talk a little bit about the the programs that I've been working on, but um, some of the the students that I started to work with started at 12 years old and all the way to 16 to 18 years old, and um, a lot of them had stories about police pulling them aside and putting them in handcuffs and putting them in car in hot cars and uh, you know like pushing their faces on their on the hood and you know, for no reason, just just to do it. I'm not sure. Just to, uh, I I would ask the students, and they all had a pretty pretty uh, con consistent answer that the police would tell them, "Sorry, you fit the description." They would they were they would let them go, but they put this in their psyche that they fit a description of a criminal. Um, so that was something that um, was a little heavy. But so these pieces are arms sticking out of a wall in the, the instance of when you, you're told to put your hands behind your back. So um, the shadows were kind of really important for this piece because uh, obviously the, the, the pieces look very ethereal, but then the shadows kind of, you can see this angst and like, you know, uh, almost feeling of frustration and uh, uh, feeling like, you know, you're broken. So here you see a little bit of that shadow that has uh, you know, a little bit of that. And this piece is uh, in Armando Duron's collection. I'm not sure if you invited him to participate. Um, here's another clear piece that comes out in that video um, in the Amer uh, Craft in America Neighbors episode. Um, I forget who the collectors are, um, but we managed to track them down and get a photo for that, for that series because um, a friend of mine who spoke in that video mentioned this piece and how how he was really taken by it. Um, I mean, can you uh, change the change the slide? We're still looking at the hands. There you go. Oh, okay. There. Oh, it, it, must be, it must be lagging. There it is. You have to see the, the boots now, right? Yeah. So now we're looking at boots, uh, combat yeah. boots, uh, kind of representing uh, 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 you know maybe a person of color that went to the the war uh, in Fallujah. That that's that was a the, the war that was going on at that time. So I, I made these boots uh, as a representation for somebody that didn't make it back. So this is kind of like what came back um, for a family to kind of have as a, as a memory of their, of their son or daughter or, or, or brother or sister. Um, <clears throat> so if you look at that video, you kind of get a little bit more uh, background on the, on that piece. This is a, uh, Large scale piece. One of the one of the one of my biggest feats actually um, to date, which was a life size man. Um, I call him farm worker, and 
still working with that transparency and um, um, because being really subtle with the imagery. Um, uh, it has a, uh, in the shirt, a, a farm workers union flag, which represents, um, you know, has a, a very loaded uh, icon for, for, for farm workers and uh, the struggles that, that they endured and uh, for human, human rights, basically. Um, but this is a, a farm worker being criminalized. He's also an immigrant. And uh, in his arms, you see the words niaki, niaya, which means neither here nor there. And uh, so I produced this piece a while ago. It was, uh, it was first shown um, in, uh, with uh, Craft in America um, in a show we had in LA uh, that was uh, an overview of California art, artists in craft, making art and craft. And um, recently I'm, I'm excited and happy to say that it was purchased by the Chrysler Museum for their permanent collection. Um, and this is one of those things again where I'm like just kind of shocked that that they would recognize a piece that has this type of symbolism and uh, meaning for for this constituency uh, uh, for the immigrant community and uh, you know and and obviously very important for what's happening currently and what's what's ha what has been happening with immigrants uh, in this country and and obviously right now in uh, in Ukraine and and. And people fleeing, and and uh, <clears throat> you know, just what 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 immigrants go through is, you know, has uh, pretty horrific in in a lot of cases. Um, so here's a, a little bit of a close up of the of the arms, and a close up of the face, and once again, the idea of somebody being broken, like not being able to make it. Um, the whole world is kind of coming against you. You know, you you come here to this country, leaving, you know, a persecution and maybe horrific uh, environment to try to make a living, and then you're and then you're being criminalized. So it's kind of the look of defeat um, is something that I was trying to project, which is something that I am familiar with uh, walking around in some of these underserved communities where people don't have the proper resources to make it. And uh, so, anyways, I just wanted to talk a little bit about that piece. Not sure if Carolyn Nito is is on this meeting, but um, uh, I want to thank her for for recognizing this work. And and uh, she's a curator at the Chrysler Museum. Of hi, for the hi, Nate. I'm on the call. I'm happy to to see that piece and to hear you talk about it. Oh, thank you. I'm glad you. I'm glad you were uh, able to make it. Thank you. Yeah, we're we're ecstatic to have that at the Chrysler Museum of Art, and I hope folks can come and see it because it's on on view. Yes, and I got to say that um, Carol Carolyn has done an amazing work with which what she's doing there, and, and it's and I'm really excited to be part of that and um, <clears throat> and uh, have my work in in this amazing collection and 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 everything that she's doing there is. Um, if you haven't been to the Chrysler Museum, I highly recommend it. They have a really amazing collection. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Carolyn. Um, here we are. Um, this is uh, some of the mo more current work. I, I made this piece in the last couple of years and uh, I've been, I have been wanting to make this work. And I don't know if you remember, um, Aaron, I spoke to you at this work about this idea at SOFA a few years back. And it's a life-size crocodile. And I've, I've been, I've had this, this idea to make this life-size crocodile. Uh, this one's five foot tall, I mean, sorry, long. Um, I've made another one at North Carolina for residency I did there last year. Um, so I have to put that one together, it's still there. I haven't picked it up and, and, but I have another residency there this summer where I will put that piece together and working on some new exciting work, uh, which I don't really wanna talk about just yet. But, um, but, so this is a hanging crocodile. It, it was an exhibition at the Pittsburgh Glass Center. Um, I want to thank Chris um, for helping me uh, put this piece, uh, uh, hanging this piece, and figuring out the logistics of it. Um, you know, I always get uh, a lot of input before I do something like this, obviously, because I never want anybody to get hurt, or I want everything to be foolproof, 100%. So, um, so I always do a ton of experimentation. And, um, and talk to a lot of professionals on the best way to do things. And, and uh, so this is a pretty 
pretty big feat um, to hang this crocodile up above. Um, I have another actually photograph from below so you kind of see the form from underneath. Um, and um, this idea was, uh, you know, taken from, I guess, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of speculation, obviously, of, of the idea of where they started hanging hot crocodiles, but um, it goes all the way to the Renaissance when they were hanging them in uh, cabinets of curiosities. And um, I mean, later the on- the photo's not working. You kick back, kick forward again. There you go. Now we can oh, see okay. it. It's great now. Okay. One okay. More, one more time uh, forward. There it goes. So you said it would it kick, okay. the idea of hanging crocodiles comes from where? Um, so it, it originally uh, they, they were they were uh, they 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 were kind of presented in cabinets of curiosities during the Renaissance, and then later on they started to uh, uh, show up in apothecaries, and uh, uh, you know there was uh, some instances where they hung them in churches and uh, universities. So um, there was a notion that this became kind of a talisman. Um, and the apothecaries to ward off disease in churches to ward off evil. And I like to think that they hung them in universities as well to ward off ignorance. So uh, when, I, when I produced this, this, this piece originally, when I came, you know, obviously a, a few years back, uh, they, there was a lot of polarity happening in politics and all of that. So I thought it would be the perfect piece to hang uh, in entrances to represent that, uh, to ward off, to be a talisman to represent, to ward off evil, ignorance, and disease. Um, obviously, uh, very reflective of our time. Um, so here's an image of, uh, I got invited to Corning on a separate occasion to do, um, to do a demonstration. Actually, this was the first uh, 2300 that the Corning Museum had in their new amphitheater space. I forget what year it was, uh, a few years back before I moved to Pittsburgh, maybe four or five years ago. Um, and, uh, sorry, maybe five or six years ago. Um, so I made a life-size child, uh, all hot, um, and he was, you know, in the fashion of hitting a piñata. So in his, he's wearing a blindfold and I actually had a stick, which I maneuvered in and out of his hands to kind of get him in the right position. Um, and I did this live for their first 2300 in their new amphitheater. Um, and it was a really uh, amazing and fun um, uh, demonstration. One of, one of the most craziest demonstrations I've ever done, basically. Besides maybe the crocodile. I did a crocodile in front of an audience at the Pittsburgh Glass Center. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, so those are all clear, clear sculptures um, and talking, you know, just uh, looking a little bit uh, or focusing a little bit on that direction of body of work uh, that is, that is inspired um, basically by clear, clear and transparent work with no color or um, uh, no, no glass color coloring on it or very little. Um, so Cuando Rio Suena was an exhibition, um, I had at the Pittsburgh Glass Center, um, 2019, um, and it was a body of work that I produced to uh, reference the child separation, child migration that was going on at the time, and also child detention. So here are some life-size glass clear sculptures uh, in front of a nine-foot wall. Um, to represent like a divide, the dividing wall uh, of our barrier, of our, of our borders. Um, and here is uh, a child that was separated from her mom and her mom was being arrested. And this is a, kind of a ubiquitous image. I'll, I'll sh I think I have the next slide, but I just wanna talk a little bit about this one. Um, so her mom is being arrested and uh, there was an audio that I had also in conjunction with this with this, there was a slide being projected on a wall in front of my sculpture. And the, the sculpture is obviously a little bit under life size, but I wanted to really take the perspective of the child in this instance, you know, to give the spectator kind of the, the feeling of what, what horrific tra 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 traumatization that this child was going through, uh, seeing her mom being taken away and stuff like that. And, and just being separated at such a young age makes me think of my daughter 
who is uh, about, you know, now she's six years old, but um, just kind of really hit home. So here's a, a, cl a close up of that sculpture. And here is the actual image that I was working from. Um, so a lot of the pieces in this exhibition were actual portraits of real children. Um, and here we have uh, a hanging angel. Uh, so this exhibition had angels and those angels were depictions of children that passed away during that time frame, uh, that really awful humanitarian, I mean, even now, but, but back then uh, uh, during that time where our, our, the, the um, policy was just awful and uh, about, I think 13 children died under, uh, passed away under custody uh, being detained uh, with not with not given their proper uh, uh, due process or anything like that. Um, and a lot of them passing away for simple things like having a flu. Um, so this is just kind of some images of the realities of children being detained, um, which I can't believe, you know, that we would ever do something like that. Or, you know, um, that, this, that this is U.S. policy. So here's a portrait of a child that passed away under custody, uh, an angel. Um, these were clothes that were actually worn by real migrant children crossing the border. Um, and uh, these pieces were borrowed uh, um, to be in this exhibition by an artist that uh, collected these, these, these pieces at the border. He was working as a janitor at the time and he was supposed to throw away all of these people's belongings. And I guess the policy was you only get to keep the clothes that are on your back. Everything else went into the trash. And so this person collected about 10, 10 items of clothing and uh, personal items and allowed me to borrow them uh, for this exhibition. So these are actual, uh, actual uh, items that were taken from people. Here's another angel. Um, I mean, I could talk about this show for a very long time, but um, this was probably the most important part of the exhibition, um, which were handwritten letters written by actual migrant children that had gone through the process of leaving their homes and trying to enter into the U.S. and actually made it. So they were uh, they were they were some of the lucky ones, but not so lucky because some of the stories are pretty horrific on some of the uh, horrors that they faced in the process of, of uh, migrating. So, um, so yeah, um, I feel like, you know, that was the, the kind of like the biggest impact I feel uh, was reading some of the actual stories, the uh, firsthand accounts, obviously people polar, polar, uh, polarize, uh, you know, situations and, and things become political and you hear things in the news and, but the, the story that was lacking was the actual story from that person that went through it. So these, this exhibition offered that voice um, of that child. So moving along, um, here are some of my students from uh, Watts, a program I started in uh, South LA. Um, so part of what I do as an artist is also, uh, uh, you know, uh, physically offer classes and <clears throat> offer uh, uh, opportunities for underserved kids to be able to blow glass. So um, I started this in, uh, you know, maybe like six, seven, maybe more like, no, it was uh, like 10 years ago in South LA, started a program uh, where we offered uh, youth or any, actually, it wasn't even only youth, it was uh, just people from the community opportunities to blow glass for free to anybody that was interested. So I was working with a, a large group of kids for about four years, um, teaching them how to, how to blow glass and uh, just giving them a resource. Obviously, glass is what I specialize in, so that's what I can offer. So, um, so we, and, and it's also a rare resource, like uh, the glass community is not as diverse because People of color have it. Uh, it's, it's a lot harder to 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 have glass accessible to them because it's so expensive. So, 
it's a it's a it's a precious medium and it's it's obviously very expensive to a uh, very expensive resource. So the fact that I found an organization that had a glass blowing studio, uh, Watts Labor Community Action Committee, uh, I was presented to them and and they they're looking for somebody to run their program. I'm like, this is what I've been trying to do. So so we got together and uh, for four years offered glass blowing classes and uh, currently a couple of my students are working in glass and doing commission work and working with professional artists. So I'm really excited and happy that that I was that I was able to to uh, offer that resource and and uh, and give people these these opportunities. So here in Pittsburgh now, I um, started a program uh, in collaboration with the Pittsburgh Glass Center. Uh, they've been very supportive with my work, both my work, but also some of the initiatives that I kind of try to support. Um, and these were children of immigrant uh, communities, uh, Im Im immigrant folks that live in Pittsburgh. Um, so um, working specifically with Casa San Jose uh, in collaboration with the Pittsburgh Glass Center and Casa San Jose to uh, offer free glass blowing classes to some of the youth, uh, some of the local youth here. And, um, you know, just talk a little bit more about some of my vision for this is that I really want to try to create a glass blowing studio. I did, I have, after the Watts program, I had my own glass blowing studio in LA where I offered uh, free glass blowing classes in my own studio. I did a Kickstarter, raised funds to do that for a few years. And then I moved to Pittsburgh. I still have all the equipment and um, hoping to soon acquire a building to be able to continue that work. Um, and I think it's important to have that studio be in the community because it just makes it a lot more accessible. So it's create, giving access in the, in a location where where obviously uh, people can just walk in and and and, and do it. Um, so that's that's something that uh, I'm currently working on um, to try to achieve here in Pittsburgh now where I live. Um, so obviously I've been invited to to work with different programs in different places. Um, this is in Chicago at Ignite, uh, working with their youth programs there. Um, so obviously you know we we support each other and. There's a few programs across the country. Uh, um, uh, uh, Pearl Dick is also one of the people that's kind of really um, spearheading some of the, some of this work. And currently, uh, recently, uh, Corey and Cedric uh, started a, also a program. I forget exactly what it's called right now, um, but they're also doing a big program where they where they help youth kind of uh, travel and. Um, and uh, offer them resources and, and, and opportunities. And here is my inspiration. I don't know if you guys see this new slide uh, yeah. of my daughter. Um, this is Adeline. She's my six-year-old daughter, and she is basically my joy and inspiration for for all that I do <laughs> nowadays. So, anyways, that pretty much wraps it up. Um, uh, so that that was kind of that's the last slide. Um, so I don't know if you want to try to open it up to questions or. Sure, I'll go ahead and stop sharing your screen or feel free to open questions. People have enjoyed yeah. enjoyed your talk and made some comments about, how, especially myself, on how powerful the work is that you do and the efforts for your community, which continue. And it's great to see your inspiration. My children inspire me every day, so I guarantee you have that same feeling um, when you come home and, and have a, have that kind of opportunity at home, of leaving work yeah. at home and having fun and being a, being a kid once again. So. Um, thank you again for being part of this presentation and for and for and being a part of NGG. This uh, video and the presentation, when it's ready, will be up on the notgrammasbass.com website for those to check out and share. And obviously, those who miss it can enjoy have enjoyed this on Facebook or can enjoy it on YouTube. And we do these almost every week. I'm trying to be pretty consistent, um, but getting ready for the big show in April is taking some time. So, thank you again, Jaime, for doing this today. I'm glad we got through the, the technical stuff. This is really, really interesting. And I'm, I'm hopefully we'll be part of what you do in the future and obviously support you and, and your efforts with the community any way we can, because they, the children you work with and those who dive into the, the medium of glass and art in general are the future, whether we like it or not. And that's really great, a great part of what you do and what we're honored to have you. So, and that's what Thank a lot you. of the artists in the NGG presentations do is they're, they're so focused on the community too. And so, Thank you for being here today. And thank you, Stephanie. 
<laughs> as well for being here. We love you, Jaime. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thanks for your support and, and uh, awesome like opportunities you offered. So yeah. fun. I told Hane yeah. while he was here, he probably should give up that glass stuff because he's such a good painter. <laughs> <laughs> I, I believe it. I believe it. Don't give it up, uh, but definitely travel around and keep keep it up and keep exposing uh, the world to what you do. And 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 those sure. who have a chance to go to see the work at the Carson Museum, I'm hopefully to make it down there sometime soon. I can't wait. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, I definitely, I highly recommend anybody that, that is in the area or would like to visit. Um, they have an amazing collection there and what they're doing, I think is very innovative and should be looked at by other museums. So I really kind of support what Carol, uh, Carol, Carrie or Carol is trying to do there. Um, <clears throat> and um, yeah, does anybody have any questions? I was just kind of wondering if, uh, are, we, is, are we doing a Q&A or? Nope, we're just we're just enjoying the talk, and people oh. have been typing in, in the in the comments that they're appreciative of your work. Okay. So, worry not about that. Cool. But thank you again for joining us today, I mean, Thank you, everybody, and we'll see yeah. you all uh, next week for the next Zoom. And if you have any questions, contact me, and I'll we'll be in touch with Jaime anytime. And and that's about it. So, thanks again. Thank, thank you, everybody, for joining. Really, uh, thank you. It means a lot, and we'll see you soon. Take care, everybody. Bye bye.